to uh, the announcements that I made um, mostly last Friday, I think. Um, I did redo the syllabus to try and make your uh, life a little bit easier because I have fallen behind in the lectures. What that means for today is that we're, am, am I, somebody have a question? Or just maybe a microphone is on. Um, what that means for, for today is that when we go into the lecture questions, as you probably saw, we're going to jump over a lot of the respiratory anatomy lecture questions. And during lab, I'm going to make sure that we go through those Ideally, where I can flash back and forth and show you some of the models and occasionally a slide or something that would help you with your preparing for the lab test as well. But what I would like to remind you of before, um, before we jump into lecture questions is something we talked about in lab last week, and that is that the upper respiratory tract, even the parts of the lower, the parts that are considered the conducting zone, their main uh, purpose in life is to make sure the air that's out here not only gets to the respiratory ex gas exchange surface, which is called the respiratory zone, but on its way that it is filtered for potential pathogens and dust and dirt and whatever else you might be inhaling um, and then it is warmed so that when it gets to your incredibly large respiratory uh, zone, um, you aren't going to lose a lot of body heat by uh, that heat being transferred to the, the gases that come in, to the air that comes in, and then pushed out as heat when you breathe out. Of course, you lose some, but you're not losing uh, as much. When you, if you can warm that air. So the air never reaches its core body temperature, but it gets much warmer and therefore you lose less heat. And then finally, you wanna make sure you, use, uh, you lose less water as well. So you wanna humidify the air to, well, nearly 100% humidity by the time it gets into the lungs. So in the lab, we'll look at adaptations that allow that to happen. And um, one of the things I did bring up last week is a lot of these adaptations are, ironically, given what you know in uh, the flow of blood, to try and prevent laminar flow and try and to increase turbulent flow. So that's going to be um, important for today's, today's discussion. So it looks like Noah has a, a question. So you can go ahead and speak it aloud if you want to. Yeah, so I was looking at the announcement and it says like we're skipping the anatomy and respiratory questions and going straight to the physi physiology ones, but I couldn't find that lecture set. The lecture set? Question, like yeah, you know how you post your lecture set questions from like as worksheets? Um, Oh, really? There was no respiratory physiology lecture set? No, I only found the um, anatomy one, unless I'm mistaken. There's only well, four lecture questions. Possible. <laughs> Who knows? But I think I, yeah, because I had to individually load into Canvas each one. I am reusing the ones from the previous year, so it wasn't something I didn't write. I will double check that, but we do have them. You have the ones we're dealing with today because they're in an this, this right? one. I think I missed one. One is in the uh, Zoom, Zoom conference. They are additional in the Zoom conference. Okay. All right. Well, let me double check that. I'll go out into to Zoom once you guys are in your, your breakout rooms. But you have the ones we're dealing with. And then I'll make sure it's loaded. So if you want to use it as a Word document when you're taking your, your notes... Um, you'll have it loaded up. So as soon as we break into groups, I'll make sure I go off into there. And if it's not there, I, I have it. It's not a problem. I will uh, make sure it gets loaded up. So yeah, just email me if you come across that over the weekend. I don't mind making sure it's all straightened out. Um, so my ambition is that, as you'll see, I moved the exam into the twenty. 
9th from the 27th, if I have those dates right, giving us one more day uh, to finish these up. So I'm hoping today that we get through all of essay four and uh, most, but not all, of essay five. And uh, that's what these lecture questions kind of cover. So the first part of essay five we, is it actually the very beginning of the next, um, next lecture. And then we're going to be doing some laws, which are physical laws, uh, three of them. And um, to help you remember them, because they are called by the names of uh, physics hasn't been changing them into taking people's names off of things as much, are Boyle's, Dalton's, and Henry's Law. And you might notice they're in alphabetical order, B, D, and H. And that might help you remember the name with what, what the law covers. So... Um, if we get through that, which I'm hoping we will, then, um, then we'll go on Thursday through uh, the remainder of five and six, and we might even begin seven, which means that we will have time for a review on Tuesday, the 27th. So I would ho I'm hoping that most of that lecture will be uh, a review for the, the next lecture exam. So... Um, to help in lab, and I know I kind of dumped a whole lot of, on you in, in lab, like, okay, you're looking at all the models today and all the slides, and we hadn't discussed any of the anatomy yet in lecture. So what I'm going to be doing in lab today is kind of like what I had to do last week because of the technical problems, which is I'm going to not make groups for those. I'm going to try and go through the the lecture questions which are based on the anatomy. And if I can, if I'm coordinated enough, I'll jump into uh, the pictures that you have of our models or uh, maybe a few slides, but mostly the models that help look at that anatomy um, and uh, see how those structures do the warm moistening and filtering part of the uh, of the job of the conducting zone. Okay, so that's the plan. Um, if you don't have your lecture questions in a you know, printed Word document, because somehow they didn't get loaded by me, um, not to worry, I will be loading it up. But you do have in announcements these groups. So you'll see that I have made um, groups, again, I've divided it mostly by trying to keep together topics that are related. So if the questions cover related topics, then, then uh, that's, there may be more questions in one group uh, than another group. So is it fine if we break up into groups at this point? Any questions before we do about either the syllabus the schedule, anything else. You can put it in chat if you're reluctant. Okay. All right. So let me uh, get to setting out the breakout rooms. And before I do anything, well, it doesn't let me do that. I'm going to sign them manually. And we're going to make five rooms. Let's see. One, two. I think we're all back now. So um, this first group has uh, somewhat anatomy-related questions because the first one asks about subtypes of tissues. And you will see some of that in lab today, but not all of it. So I, I did go ahead and, and put it in, in this because it's so critical for the rest of the discussion. So do you have a spokesperson for <laughs> your question 10 and the anatomy one? Is that you, Alexis? Or just you? Yeah. Are you the spokesperson or is there someone in group A that's a spokesperson? I'm gonna have to take a picture who's in all these groups. No spokesperson for group A? Let me take a look and see. If show me, oh. Well, I do see you're in there, Alexis, or 
Are you willing, or Eric, or Ileana, or Lewis? Are you willing to be a spokesperson, or Prabhdeep? Prabhdeep? Sorry, I didn't realize we were group one. Oh, sorry. Okay, Ileana, do you want to be the spokesperson? We're starting with question 10, right? Yes, 10, about the respiratory zone. Okay. Um, so... Uh, I have, it's primarily um, simple squamous epithelia with uh, some simple cuboidal. And we weren't sure if there was a uh, columnar. No. No, there's no columnar. We, yeah, we, we, there was some debate in our group um, as to whether it was in there or not. Um, and then uh, we said it's very thin. Uh, it has enormous surface area and contains elastic fibers. And uh, some of the unique adaptations are that, or one of them is that uh, the pores can link clusters of alveolar sacs to each other. Great. Um, so that's 10, right? Yes, that was 10. Oh. So just going on with the story, these two, these different subtypes have names, these two different subtypes that make up the alveoli uh, sacs, uh, type one and type two cells. So maybe correlate those names with the two subtypes that we're talking about. And then what they secrete, I think, is the functions and secretions of these two subtypes. Can you do that or is someone else in the group want to jump up? This is question 11. Okay, so um, type one was the simple squamous uh, and it mainly does gas exchange, but also secretes ACE. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then type two is the simple cuboidal, which uh, secretes water with surfactant, which uh, breaks the surface tension and helps to collapse the lungs. Okay, so um, that brings us to 12. So you've brought up two structures that help cause the alveoli sacs to collapse. And when you're worrying about this is when you're exhaling. You want them to collapse and lower their volume. And we'll soon talk about the laws, I think the next group maybe, uh, that uh, affect this. But what two things, well, one, you brought up the surface tension. And what's the other idea. Uh, so yeah, the first one was the surfactant, which breaks the surface tension. And then the other one, I have the fibers of the laminopropia. Great. All right. So um, I just want to share the screen for a minute. You first wake this up because if I don't do that, I won't. Okay, so let me share the screen and just make sure because that one of the issues, oops, wrong share, uh, what happened? I'm sure I picked my iPad, iPhone, iPad, AirPlay, share. Okay. One of the things I find people get confused about in, in this, everything Eliana said was correct. So what happens is in, I'm just gonna draw those simple, I'm gonna try and draw, there we go, there we go. Okay, you're seeing that I hope. So this is one of the alveoli sacs. And it's most of the cells are these simple squamous epithelial cells. Now, why you have to worry, we'll just keep it going all the way to the poor. Why you have to worry about the um, surface tension is if I change the color here, there is a thin fluid, watery fluid that has to be secreted along the um, lining of this air sac. So air is, is in the middle here, we'll just make air green. Um, and why you need that is that you cannot allow, or gases cannot move across the lipid bilayer without first being dissolved in this fluid. 
So if, you know, if that weren't the case, the best thing to do is to just allow the air to come in and then the gases go across the lipid bilayer of the simple squamous cells to get eventually out to the bloodstream on the outside of these, these pockets. But one of the rules is that you, you can't, that can't happen without, and I don't know the physics of why it can't happen, without first dissolving the gas. So you have to get the O2 to be first in this watery solution. Well, the one of the magical properties of water, as you might have heard, is surface tension. So surface tension has to do with those hydrogen bonds. Now, I hope I talked about this a bit. So at the border between the air and the water, if this is that border, there is an alignment of all of the H2Os because they cannot freely uh, hydrogen bond across that border. This is air out here. Then they're, they're almost lined up in a almost, well, very close to crystalline sort of arrangement. All of them have to be arranged in a way that they can maximize their hydrogen bonding with each other. So I'm just going to say, oops, sorry, I did it again. I keep hitting that. Uh, many hydrogen bonds are here without attempting to draw this because that are all aligned with each other. And you have to break that alignment so that all the H2Os that are in this almost crystal um, form a high amount of surface tension. So this leads to high surface tension. Now you want that surface tension generally in biology or utilize it for a lot of good things. So it's not and we're going to utilize it shortly for helping you to have your lungs follow the chest wall as it moves. But, but in this case, it's a problem because these alveoli sacs, you've seen them if you started to draw the slides, are really tiny. And if water were to try and maximize the way it could make H bonds, when you go to breathe out, maybe I'll make it actually make it another sac here first. Don't go to breathe out. Oops. And the sac gets smaller, the water can come get compressed in here, right? And it comes close to be in contact with each other. If the two sides become in contact with, with each other, the hydrogen bonding that tries to occur, these are like, think of them maybe like little magnets on the ends of the um, oxygens and hydrogens, and they're going to try and snap together to make the maximum number of hydrogen bonds that they can. They're constrained on this border on how many hydrogen bonds that they, they can make on that border, but they're not so constrained if they get to be solidly water in here and come together. And that would uh, cause the alveoli to stay collapsed. And then in order to reinflate it and go to the larger size again. So as you try and go to the larger size, you've got to break all those hydrogen bonds, cause them to realign like they do along this, this border. And that's not maximizing the hydrogen bonding. So there is a, a chemical or a, an energy barrier that you have to overcome in order for this to happen. Is this making sense? Let me get chat to make sure there's any questions about this. Okay, and uh, I don't see any. All right, so, um, so we will talk about a condition. I don't remember if it's in here, but it's in my lecture. I don't think it's in the lecture questions. When uh, that, this sort of thing can happen over here, and that's in premature infants with uh, around the 30th week of gestation for an infant. So there's, uh, what, nine months is, you know, can't do the math right now, but um, what is that, four or five months old, around the 30th week of gestation. Uh, you, the cells that secrete the uh, surfactant begin to do it, but before, before that, 
you just have a watery secretion in there. Now, it doesn't matter because, of course, in an infant, the lungs are collapsed like this. And that watery secretion is, is fine. You're not trying to do gas exchange across the lung. So if a baby is born prior to there being enough surfactant, then when they go to breathe um, out, their alveoli recollapse, and it's almost like there is, think of Velcro or whatever, all those hydrogen bonds. You have to pull them apart again to reinflate the alveoli. And it takes a lot of physical muscular energy to do that. And little tiny infants don't have very much of that. So um, even when I was young, which was a long time ago, or a young child, they've started to be able to treat kids for this. And one of the ways to do is to put them in a positive pressure air chamber where you're forcing the air in to try and help their their breathing, their inflation, and bring in more air. And now we have drugs that we can give them to try and induce more surfactant to be released. But one of the things that I find students uh, kind of chronically um, misunderstand is that when you add the surfactant, so let's add some surfactant to this, What's happening is you're intercalating in between the water molecules every now and then, and not just along the border, but everywhere, this, this soap-like substance that breaks up the surface tension. Now, it doesn't get rid of it altogether. It causes it to, to be a lower surface tension if you have these uh, surfactants in there. So it's not that there is no surface tension, which I do tend to see in the past, people misunderstanding. It's that there is a decrease in the surface tension. So that this sort of thing would help break up the surface tension so you wouldn't get a total uh, collapsing. You would hopefully be able to reinflate uh, the lung more easily, but the surface tension is still there. Now, why I'm bringing this up is that it is, of course, um, one of the forces of collapse that Ileana. Now, why you want to collapse is so that you don't have to use energy in order to breathe out. So when you're doing relaxed breathing, you're unconsciously um, breathing, you're not thinking about it, then you end up using uh, skeletal muscles and they use up ATP when you inhale. But when you exhale, all you do is relax those skeletal muscles, which means it takes less ATP, ATP overall to, um, to uh, breathe and get uh, air in and out of your lungs. Now, if you didn't have this high, this some surface tension here, you need some surface tension because that some surface tension helps the uh, collapsing. The other thing that uh, Ileana mentioned helps the collapsing is that underneath in the basement membrane, it's very thin, but you have elastic fibers and elastic fibers tend, as you know, to uh, resist stretching. You take a little extra force when you inhale to stretch those guys. But as soon as you are no longer pulling on them, just like no longer pulling on an elastic um, rubber band, you let go, they are going to go back to their um, the length that is their resting length. These elastic fibers are in that basement membrane underneath the um, surface epithelia of the respiratory membrane and between that and the blood vessels that are going to surround and in, um, in ex I'll just say extracellular matrix, but it's the basement membrane that's in between the blood vessels and those simple squamous cells. So I believe uh, Ileana mentioned that it's the type two that are releasing this surfactant. So this is from the type two cells that are the simple cuboidal. You are not going to see, I don't know why it's going so slow. Uh, you're not gonna see these cuboidal, they're really pretty flat. 
She also mentioned that there was little controversy about whether any of the pseudo-stratified columnar. Well, they very rapidly in the terminal bronchi become uh, short, and I talked about that last week, so that they're almost cuboidal. And they, when they're like that, they can be thin enough to do gas exchange, but it's trivial compared to what these simple squamous do. So I wouldn't fuss too much about that exactness. I wouldn't expect you to know that there are some simple columnar that arose from the pseudostratified uh, columnar at the very end of the terminal bronchioli um, where gas exchange can happen. So let's just be a little more black and white and just say that the gas exchange is happening through the simple, uh, the type one and the type two cells, but primarily the type one, which are the really, really thin, simple squamous cells making up most of the walls. Now these guys not only, uh, so the blue stuff is secreted, that watery surfactant is secreted by the type two. And that's being secreted, uh, let's, did I go that way? Yeah, so this is the type two that's secreting this stuff. The type one is secreting, let's, well, maybe make it a different color, um, is secreting into the blood ACE. And you might go, well, gee, you know, that's a strange place for ACE to be secreted. Well, the reason it's secreted there is that your surface area, as the, at least the textbook says, of the type one cells, which are doing this, type one, those simple squamous cells, there's so many of them. You, your surface area for your type or for your alveoli, which is a combination of type one, type two, but mostly type one cells is as big as a football field with. So that's a lot of surface area. So that means you could very rapidly um, increase ACE levels in your blood because you have uh, so much surface area to secrete um, the uh, ACE into from your lung alveoli. Okay, so I kind of supplemented that. I think I've repeated things that were in the lecture slide, the lecture recordings, though. And uh, you guys did a great um, job. So we want to leave this with here we have our alveoli, and we're going to have two collapsing forces that you're going to use during exhale. When you exhale, there's a little bit of lag going on in my, so I'm going to get two of these, yeah. Uh, in my internet, I guess. Very long lag. You're going to utilize one, some surface tension. And I'm just going to say ST to make this go faster. Um, and two, elastic fiber rebound. Sorry, it's gotta be one technical thing or another, huh? And when that's going to decrease the volume of the alveoli space. And what I mean by space is where the air is. So the volume is gonna go down. Okay, so the next group, which is group B, is going to talk about inhalation forces that you need, and that has to do with the pleura. So do we have a spokesperson for group for group B? So I'm going to take um, that first question. Okay. So can you hear me properly. Um, so the Anatomy of the pleura. The pleura is uh, what surrounds the layers that surround the lungs. So for the innermost layer, you have the visceral pleura and that clings um, to the outer wall of the lungs, covers all of its external surfaces. Um, and then next you have the inner pleural space or the parietal cavity. And so that's the space between the visceral pleura and then the third layer, which is the parietal pleura. Um, this is a space that's filled with serous fluid. Um, and this allows for the easy movement of the lungs over the thoracic wall while we breathe. 
Uh, plus it also acts, the surface tension in that fluid acts as a force to um, resist the separating of the lungs from the thoracic wall. And so that's what enables the lungs to adhere to the wall of the thoracic cavity. So I don't know why, but the, uh, the airplay is not just doing anything. So I'll have to work with this, uh, this weird thing. But what she was trying to explain is that there is, <laughs> like, this is why I don't like using this pencil. There is a parietal layer, and that's stuck on your fascia of the muscles that line the inner part of your uh, chest wall. So that's the parietal layer. And then in between those two layers, you have a fluid. And this fluid is mostly water with some, I'm sure, electrolytes in it, but no surfactant. So the surface tension is high. So the pleural fluid is mostly water and high in surface tension. And what you're trying to do is use that surface tension, use it to glue, as it were, to stick the um, visceral and parietal layers together. Okay, so remember all those hydrogen bonds that were all aligned at the edge of the water-air interface? What we're going to do is fill this entire cavity with um, water, and all those waters are going to be making hydrogen bonds with each other, and the surface tension will be very high. But there's no air in here, and in fact, it'd be a really bad thing to have air in there. Um, and uh, therefore, it's almost like those hydrogen bonds are holding these two membranes uh, to each other. So um, that was the anatomy that had to do with that thin space. But there's another feature, and son, I was struggling with my pen, so I don't know if you talked about the negative pressure in here, did you? Uh, no, I didn't actually. Okay, and that might be because it's really uh, more later, but but what? Uh, but while we're talking about those forces, and if I can get my pen to talk to my pad again, um, we'll see why that isn't the case. Um, no, it is again, it's talking again. Okay, so um, one of those th those forces. So let me see if I I can put this on here again. Is that this fluid has one. It's still slow. Hey, Kyle, if my air, my pen is not talking to my tablet very fast, is that airplay and is that because the internet is slow? No. No? Do you know why it would be? No. Okay. I'll see what happens. If I can talk at all to it. Yeah. Okay, so sorry, this has high, I'm, I'll erase that and, uh, and we'll try and do without it. Just one thing after another. Yeah, it's not even listening to change anything. Okay, so that helps stick it together. And the second thing is the fluid is made, drains constantly from the space on this space. It's also filling constantly. New fluid replaces it. But the rate of draining exceeds the rate of forming it, exceeds replacement. So it's almost like you are allowing a uh, a tiny vacuum to occur. It doesn't, it's not a true vacuum, but if you were to uh, try and make a vacuum, if you had to do it in chemistry with running water, I don't know if you did that. What you're basically doing is pulling the air out a little faster than it's coming, able to come in, and you're making a little bit of vacuum. And if you don't let air in at all, you'll, you'll generate a vacuum in the container that you're trying to, 
to make it in. So it's draining out of here and that's faster than what's coming in. And so there's a bit of, uh, of a, well, not true vacuum, but what the forces are, what that means is that you have a negative pressure within that interpleural space. Now, why I wanted to do this now, um, even though she did a great job with the questions, is what that means is that you have two forces to, um, to help bind your visceral and parietal pleura together. And one force is that surface tension um, that helps stick them together. And the other force is this negative pressure. And I'm sure in the lecture, I talked about some of the dilemmas that can occur, some of the pathologies that can occur that breaks up these inflating forces. In order to cause your, your uh, inhalation to be successful, you need the lung surface, which is bound to this visceral layer, to then follow what's happening to your thoracic cavity as you inhale. In order to have surface tension be very high, you need to have this layer of water, this fluid layer, be extremely thin. And that's why where you're forcing all the hydrogen bonds into high surface tension arrangement. If you get excess fluid in here, like in a condition like pleurisy, where some sort of inflammation event gets more fluid poured into this area, then the water molecules can shift around a lot more. The surface tension drops relative to a very thin layer, and, uh, and that lowers the ability of that surface tension to glue the visceral and parietal layers together. So that's one way in which uh, if this surface tension breaks enough, the lung collapses. If your lung spontaneously collapses, it's called a pneumothorax. That's a spontaneous. Spontaneous doesn't mean there's no cause. It just means it's happening um, without some kind of uh, force directly causing, uh, you know, pushing it in. It's that it's. It's like unglued and it just moves rapidly into the collapsed state. Now, why it collapses is due to those two collapsing forces we just talked about. So you're constantly having to offset those two collapsing forces with these gluing forces of high surface tension and uh, negative pressure. So if you add fluid, you lower this one. The way you could have this one be disrupted is if you have a penetrating wound from the outside that allows air to get in. Uh, because remember, this is a negative pressure, meaning it's less than the atmospheric air, which we'll talk about shortly. And air can rush in here and equilibrate the pressures between outside the body and inside the body and that will cause a pneumothorax. Alternatively, and in some people this happens spontaneously, there is a disruption of the visceral, it's a very thin layer, and uh, the outside of the lung tissue and air escapes from alveoli into this space. And that's also enough to cause a spontaneous uh, pneumothorax. So, um, so those, that's great. Um, for question 13. So I alluded to all of these uh, various pressures, but the next question 14 defines them. So let me see if, uh, who, is that still going to be you, Sana, or is there someone else doing 14? Professor, I'm doing a 14. Okay, Kal Seng. So let's talk about these uh, pressures. Okay. So ventilation, or uh, PATM, okay. All right. Uh, a PATM, it, ventilation, okay. Ventilation is the air moves in from the high to low pressure, and it is due to the volume changes in thoracic cavity. And this process of moving tidal volume, uh, 500 milliliter in and out of the lung, is the ventilation, 500 milliliter. 
in and out of the ventilation. Okay, so ventilation is not air moving into your blood or even into the fluid. It's just air moving from one air volume, which is the atmosphere out here, to the air volume inside those alveoli sacs. Okay, so let me scroll this down. How do I do that? I guess what I have to do is stop sharing this. Maybe I'm sorry. And I have to go since my new apparatus is I'll just have to go to the whiteboard in um, like we did on last week. And let me grab that whiteboard, and make it bigger. So we have more space. There we go. Okay, so that was ventilation. Keep that in mind. It's a key definition that, that she just did. Okay, so how about P atmospheric, um, Kelsang? Okay, P atmosphere is the pressure exerted by the gases in atmosphere. And it varies, but it varies with the altitude and the measure at sea level. And at sea level, yes, it is what uh, sea level atmospheric pressure is normally mm, seven, seven and sixty, right? Millimeters of mercury. So millimeters of mercury, if you're familiar with weather forecasts, have to do with how much pressure it takes to move a column of mercury that I believe is one centimeter by one centimeter, one millimeter by, I don't remember the exact dimension, but how much it pressure downward it takes to move at one millimeter. Don't worry about defining that, but instead get the idea is it's a pressure measurement. So at sea level, it we're gonna, you need to know this number. If I'm writing a number, you need to know it. And, and as you increase, uh, altitude, what happens to it? Do you know uh, what you're saying? Yes, it will be decreased. It decreases. Now, why it decreases, and the analogy I could, I think I probably talked about on the recording is it's like a bunch of blankets. You could think of uh, you laying in bed with all these blankets on top of you. All those blankets are the layers of your atmosphere, you know, all the air above you. And as you crawled upward and got under fewer of them, you would feel less weight on you. So that's one way of thinking of as you go up in altitude, what happens is 760 drops to lower numbers. You have less pressure as you go up. And this is an important point for later. Okay, so how about uh, PIP? What does that one stand for? PIP is... Uh, the force exerted by the gases in the pleural cavity, like unlike the PATM, which is in the atmosphere, PIP is the pleural cavity, in the cavity. Okay. The only thing I'll argue with is no gases in there, remember? It's only fluid. Oh, yeah. So right. this is the interpleural's negative pressure. Okay, so it is exerted by the fluid in the pleural cavity. Yeah, okay. exerted because that fluid is draining faster than it's coming in. So yeah. you have this sort of uh, semi-vacuum almost, you could think of it, uh, where there's a negative pressure in there. And okay. um, relative to atmosphere, it's always negative, but also... Four millimeter less. Next one. Negative relative to P atmospheric and to... P pulmonary. And what is P pulmonary? Uh, P pulmonary is uh, the interpulmonary varies with the cavity volume and it is the force exerted by the gas within the alveoli. Within the alveoli. And one more thing, PIP is always 4 millimeter uh, of mercury lesser then, uh, then P I P P pulmonary and P atmos or P atmosphere. Great. So we'll watch this, or you watch this in the videos. It's at least sometimes it's even more minus okay. four millimeters um, relative 
to P atmospheric and always at least four millimeters less than P um, pulmonary. I don't think it's ever more, but, and so I'll just say NP pulmonary. Okay. So this is shown graphically. The value of P pulmonary varies depending on, varies relative to P atmospheric, depending on whether you're breathing in, but that variation, if you're just doing relaxed breathing, is about how many millimeters do you know? Kelsey? 760. No, um, when you're as... breathing in versus out, what is the change? Oh, change is the one millimeter difference? Yes, but with relaxed breathing or uh, tidal volume is what we'll call this, when you're not thinking about the breathing, um, it uh, ranges from uh, 759 to 761 at sea level. Yeah. So we keep using sea level, which is, you know, good for Fremont because we're pretty close to sea level in Fremont or where I live is a little higher, but uh, not much. So those numbers are all good. And that's going to be true wherever you are. It's always going to be about that. I'll say IE uh, plus one to uh, minus one when moving your millimeters of mercury and moving a tidal volume. So tidal volume TV, we're going to be dealing with in, um, in the lab on Thursday when you look at the spirometry results. But that's when you're doing relaxed me breathing. You could think of it like a tide of air, tidal amount of air, like tides going in and out. You're not thinking about it. And we will be using... Um, numbers from a man, uh, probably a fairly big man, because the number they give you is about 500 mils moves in and out. I don't remember. Yeah, I think later on there is a uh, person talking in group B about this volume. Okay, great. That's perfect. So let's go on to uh, the other part of group B is to talk about Boyle's law and how this moves, moves in and out. Is that still you, Cal Sang, or is there another person working on it? Sana will be saying, answering. Sana's gonna um, go back to doing Boyle's law? Yeah. Though we're not sure if we answered this correctly, we sort of talked about it in more um, general terms, but you can. I guess that. <laughs> but uh, Boyle's law basically um, talks about the inverse relation between pressure and volume. So pressure is inversely related to volume at a constant temperature. You don't have to and worry about temperature for Boyle's law. OK, go ahead. Because the temperature is not really changing here. Um, but in during relaxed inspiration, we have the thoracic cavities volume is increasing due to the muscles increasing that volume. And so the lungs are able to stretch and so the volume of the lungs is increasing. Um, so this causes the pressure in the lungs to decrease. So P pulmonary decreases um, about one millimeter mercury relative to P atmosphere. And that causes, and because it's less, that's causing the air to rush in because it's following its pressure gradient. Okay, and then when you exhale, those rebounding forces, what happens to P? So when you exhale, then you have the thoracic it's the opposite happens basically. Uh, so the cavity of volume decreases due to the muscles relaxing, um, the lungs recoiling. So that causes a volume to decrease, um, which increases the pressure in that area in the lungs. So the pressure um, inside the lungs increases to one millimeter mercury above the atmospheric pressure which causes air to flow out of the lungs because it's following, again, it's following its pressure gradient. 
Great. Okay. So Boyle's law in chemistry, physics, however you look at it, is just saying there is an inverse relationship between pressure and volume when you're dealing with two closed systems. And you're asking how will a liquid or a fluid, uh, I'm sorry, a liquid or a gas move between these two closed systems. Well, for us, so really the law is written as P1, and I'm not going to try and do sub versus uh, uh, times V1 equals P2 times V2. So one and two are these two closed volumes, closed systems of, in our case, gases, right? Uh, luckily for you, all we have to really worry about is this: if this is your lung as a closed system and this is the atmosphere as a closed system, then um, the atmosphere has so much larger a volume that it's still true that when you breathe out, the there's air going into the atmosphere and therefore you're adding some pressure, but it's so minuscule because the volume of the atmosphere is so huge compared to the volume of your lungs that you can basically deal with this as a constant. So if, let me just make this a little clearer, if this is your lung, lungs and they have to be in balance with, your, with, the, oops, with the atmosphere out here, volumes, then the volume of the atmosphere is so enormous compared to the volume of your lung that our equation is actually P1 V1 is equal to a constant. And that constant is P atmospheric. So it's 760 at sea level. So it's true that that actually fluctuates a little bit, but it's so tiny, it's so many you know decimal points away from zero that it's basically a constant. We can deal at, with it as a constant. Now, because of that, these are purely inverse relationships. So if volume goes up, in order to keep that as a constant, pressure has to go down. Hopefully that makes sense to, uh, to most of you. I'm hoping. So maybe I'll just write that on there. So if, uh, if the volume goes up, that means you are inhaling, right? And that means in your lungs, the pressure would drop. And in order to keep this as a constant, air has to rush in between these two closed containers. All right, so that is group uh, B. Now, when we get to uh, group C, they're going to come back and look at some of the, um, these various volumes and how you breathe. But before we do that, let's talk about the movement of air, again, in the conducting zone, but through the bronchi, but especially the smaller bronchi, where, um, where it can meet resistance to, to flow. So who is going to be the spokesperson uh, for group C? Is that you, Dina? Well, we didn't actually get to assigning the... <laughs> okay. First uh, thing to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so um, I, I'll answer the first one if anybody wants to answer. I, we've got Jessica doing number six. That was as far as we got. So, But if somebody else wants to answer any other questions, just let me know. Uh, but I'll start it off. Okay. And I'm sharing this screen because it's an important graph. So go ahead and talk about. Okay. So um, I've got a couple of ways that um, air movement through the bronchi resembles the movement of blood through the vessels. And that's um, laminar flow. Um, as seen in blood moving through the vessels, laminar flow creates resistance to airflow. Larger airways provide more space and less friction to airflow um, as, as a smaller percentage of the air drags against the airways. As the diameter of the airways diminishes, much, uh, much the same as we saw with arteries and moving to arterioles to capillaries, more and more friction slows the movement of the air through the airways. Um, and then we've got diameter. Uh, the diameter... Um, can be mechanically enlarged or dilated, 
or diminished or constricted in the bronchioles by the action of the smooth muscles surrounding them. This mechanism functions with the secretion of norepinephrine and epinephrine for dilation or ACH and histamine for contraction uh, to open or restrict the movement of air. Um, Different from the blood, turbulence um, is created within the nasal cavity during inspiration. The inspired air bounces and swirls through the scroll-like canals of the nasal concha resulting in tremendous amount in a tremendous amount of resistance to airflow by causing the air to move unpredictably and violently. The purpose of this turbulence is to warm, moisten, and filter the incoming gases as they move through the conche. Uh, typically, a few, few particles larger than six, uh, I think it's micromillimeters, make it past the sticky mucus lined nasal cavity. I can never remember what that little symbol means. The mu? Yeah. Yeah, that's micro. Mm -hmm. Okay. I find the book is confusing on this graph, which is why I'm sharing it to you, with you. You know, if you were to talk about blood vessels, what you would expect, if you recall, is if you looked at resistance and the diameter of the vessels, what you would see would resistance should keep going up and up and up as the diameters get smaller and smaller. And what you're seeing here is is sort of a a bump in this, right? Resistance actually going going up and the diameters, these are large bronchi here, going to smaller bronchi here and the resistance is going up. We're all good there. That, may, that goes along with the blood vessels. If, am I, is anyone missing what I'm saying? Just pop something into chat and I will read it if you're not sure. So this is kind of what you expect. Large to medium-sized bronchi, you're seeing an increase in resistance because the diameter is decreasing. Let's not worry about the muscles yet because at this point, the cartilaginous rings are not really allowing there to be much uh, regulation of that diameter. They're a fixed diameter. Now, where it starts to get unexpected is that suddenly, even though we know that the diameters of these, say, fixed tubules, again, don't worry about the, the smooth muscle at this point, those are getting tinier and tinier. They're branching a lot more, just like, you know, arterioles and branched more and more. And you would expect the resistance to keep increasing, but it doesn't. It decreases. So this is sort of unexpected. And it's for uh, a reason that uh, that uh, Dina brought up, but isn't really stressed very clearly in, in the book. So as the air is flowing here. If this were blood, it would be flowing in a, ter- in a laminar flow manner, and friction would be pretty minimal. Um, as it's flowing um, through the middle, it's going fast, and when the diameter gets smaller, less goes through the middle, so resistance goes up. Well, that's somewhat true, but none of the air is flowing in a laminar fashion in these large bronchi to medium-sized bronchi. They are, it's flowing as Dina brought up because of all of the concha and the sinuses and everything else in your upper, upper respiratory tract. It's extremely turbulent. So we have very little laminar flow as it's going, as this diameter is getting smaller and smaller. As they get to the medium sized bronchi, it's almost like all that. You could think of water uh, going through this turbulent rocky stream and then suddenly into nice you know, gradually into more and more smooth canals. And as it does, more and more of it is flowing laminar. So it's actually the increase in laminar flow, even though diameter is dropping, that causes resistance to actually drop. And when you get down to the openings, it just opens up. So you could think of water spilling into an open vessel you have very little resistance at at all at the very ends here. Is this graph making sense? Think about this. 
because what we're seeing, and if I could write on this, which maybe I, I can let's see, I'm just going to try and put it as a, a T here. We have largely turbulent flow here. And then as you get over here, you have a mixture of turbulent and um, laminar flow. And then as you go down into the smaller ones, it's pretty purely laminar flow. And that's dropping, even though the diameter is getting smaller, that's dropping the resistance. Now, let's bring in those smooth muscles that she mentioned. The smooth muscles, when you get down to the smallest bronchioli and eventually the terminal bronchioli, there's only plates of uh, cartilage. So the smooth muscle takes up more of that uh, muscularis externe layer, and it does allow you under certain conditions that uh, Dina brought up to cause uh, the diameter to get even smaller or to enlarge and get bigger. And just like with blood, that means that if it's bigger diameter, you're allowing more laminar flow, less friction and resistance drops. If it's smaller diameter, resistance is going to increase relative to whatever point it was. So let's say we're right at this point and we, va we uh, bronchiodilate, resistance would actually you know, go down even further and air would flow much more easily. If we're at that same point and we cause bronchioconstriction, then resistance to flow would go up and air would move more with more resistance and more friction down into the alveoli. So um, she also, and I'm glad she brought it up because it was actually question nine in your anatomy ones about what neurotransmitters and, and hormones can act to cause constriction and dilated, dilation. So at rest, acetylcholine causes a tonic constriction on the bronchioli. So you have a sort of low level of acetylcholine that is causing your diameters to be lower. Now you'd say, why would it do that? Well, because you don't need more air to go in there. And it's going to allow you to dilate, to relax that smooth muscle and make it bigger when norepinephrine and epinephrine are released. Since the smooth muscle, which is, by the way, multi-unit smooth muscle, is uh, relaxing, um, that must mean these are beta-2 receptors. So I'm kind of answering question nine in the anatomy. They're beta-2 receptors because they are inhibited by uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine. Um, there are hormones. The only ones besides epinephrine that you need to uh, know about is histamine, and histamine does cause a constriction like, um, like uh, acetylcholine. So, um, so hopefully this graph makes a bit more sense than if you were sitting here and this was just a blood vessel, you would expect that as diameter got smaller and smaller, resistance should just keep climbing and climbing. Are we good on this one? This was kind of a hard one. Any questions in chat? Okay, so let me get out of this. And Cal Sang, did you have a question or was it just you? A little noise, maybe a little noise. All right, so let me go back to the whiteboard um, and we'll go on to the next question. Oh, God, we're running out of time. I go way too slow in this way of doing this. Um, so let's try and get through C. Uh, I need to erase all this stuff. And is there someone who's going to tell us about these terms you need for um, for the lab on Thursday? Oops, I keep stuttering my typing here. Um, I guess I can go through them real quickly. Okay. Um, so I've got uh, TLC is the total lung capacity. And that is the maximum amount of air contained in the lungs after a maximum inspiratory effort. 
the normal value for males is 6,000 milliliters and females is 4,200 milliliters. Um, let's see, I've got TLC equals TV plus IRV plus ERV plus RV. RV being the residual volume. IRV plus ERV plus, oops, plus oops, RV. RV, and where is your tidal volume? Tidal volume is, that was the first okay, one. Plus the tidal volume, right? The first one you said, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, so let's go. And we already defined this was the amount of air you move. I'm just trying to hurry things along. Yeah, tidal volume, the amount of air inhaled or exhaled with each breath under normal conditions. And it's the same value for males or females is 500 ml. And I wouldn't, I would argue it's not the same. It's, it depends on the size of your chest. So sure. women tend to be smaller. And if we did this in the lab, you'd probably find most of the women were um, uh, around 300, 400. And sure. even smaller men would be that, that smaller. But that's okay. We're going to use the numbers I'm putting here, 6,500. And uh, did I put the right abbreviation here? Yeah, functional residual capacity. Yeah, I've got yeah. that as the volume of air remaining in the lungs after a normal tidal volume expiration. And it's also got a formula. Right, FRC equals ERV plus RV. And RV, I guess I didn't have on that list. No, it's not. It's residual volume. Can you tell us what that is? Uh, it's the amount, if I remember correctly, I didn't define it here. It's the amount remaining at the end or that's, that's right yeah after a maximal exhalation so this is the movable immovable air right exhaling uh, i.e immovable air and i've got a normal value for males is 2400 milliliters and females is 1800 okay um so 2400 i think that's the functional that's this one yeah that's for the frc yeah so that's the 2400 and we're the number here we're going to use is 1200 um so what i mean by uh immovable air is remember that you have all that uh football field size <laughs> alveoli surface area so all those alveolar pockets are in the respiratory zone. And so this is a mixture of respiratory zone air, and that's the most of it, sorry. And that's gonna be about uh, 1050 out of that 1200. And air in the conducting zone where you can't do gas exchange. So no gas exchange. And so this is going to be called the dead space air. And that's about the same as your body weight, which in pounds. So in this case, it'll be about 100, 150 mLs. We'll say he's a 150 pound guy. So we will talk about that more in lab on Thursday. What about vital capacity? I know we're going just a few minutes over. Yeah, vital capacity is the maximum amount of air that can be expired after a maximum inspiratory if effort. Exhaled after maximal inhalation. So this is how much your movable air, all movable air, that you can maximally do. And I'm gonna to have to make a new one over here for minute respiratory volume. This is kind of changing topics. But if you went <gasps> as hard as you could in and then blew it all out, that's the, the amount you blow out is your uh, vital capacity. And then what about the last one on your list? So we'll finish up. Um, I've, is that the alveolar 
Oh, no, I'm sorry. Minute rest. Uh, yeah, I've got minute ventilation and alveolar re ventilation rate on here. Minute uh, ventilation. Yeah, MRV is the total amount of gas that flows into or out of the respiratory tract in one minute. So that's breaths per minute times of volume per breath equals MRV. So this is going to be a milliliters or liters. Yeah, um, the yeah. textbook conflicts. It says in the table, it says 10,000 millimeters, milliliters uh, per minute, but um, it's using 20 breaths per minute. In the explanation, it uses 12 breaths per minute. So I think we, I think that um, uh, six liters is what I came up with. Yeah, and it else. doesn't contradict. What happens is it's trying to do, which is kind of still silly because I hope you can do this math. It's trying to make the math easier. So yeah. for an adult, 12 to 15 is a normal respiratory rate times, I'll put times uh, 12 to 15 breaths per minute is normal. They use 20 just because it's a lot easier to, to multiply two times five than yeah. 12. So that's how they came up with uh, 10,000. We'll worry about that when we discuss this as we go forward. And then lastly, this is actually the last one. You're right. Yeah. The AV alveolar ventilation rate or AVR is a measure of ventilation, ventilation that takes into account um, the air wasted in dead space and measures the flow of fresh gases in and out of the alveoli during a particular time interval. Okay, so when you breathe air in, every time you're breathing in, you're leaving some air in your dead space, in your conducting zone. It's, you know, it's a tube, so it has to be filled with air. And only some of that air is getting down to the respiratory zone. So this is the amount that actually reaches the respiratory zone. Okay, so once again, we are going slower than I'd hoped. Um, but we're done with time here. So when we come back, I'm going to mark where we are. We're going to use this. I think what I will do is get you guys that are in group C to talk a little bit more about this in uh, lecture on or in the lab on Thursday. So instead of starting with the last two, question five and six, we'll move five and six into the lab because that's when we're going to do the spirometry, and that's where those two are really important to know about. So we'll start when we come back with group D um, on Thursday, and um, that goes through some of these other physical laws, and hopefully we will still finish and have enough time to uh, have some review on the following Tuesday. Okay, guys, so... Um, I'm going to stop sharing, and um, you will notice since Alexis reminded me, I had forgotten to um, put. Uh, I'd forgotten to put up the um, comments on the first three essays from previous semesters to help you guide your writing of those essays. They are now up there, and I will probably get the fourth one up. Uh, there actually weren't any, so I'll just give you some guidelines in my files. I didn't have any. Uh, so I'll give you some guidelines for four, uh, which we finished uh, today, except for the aspect of restrictive and obstructive diseases. And we're going to talk about that in lab on, on Thursday. So we won't be doing that in, in lecture that much. So um, you'll have four resources uh, to go by. All right. So we will see you at uh, eleven ten if you are um, if you are coming to lab the first lab section. Remember, we're going to go over. I'm going to go over. I'm not going to put you in groups. The first of those uh, anatomy questions, and I'm going to try and use the models to to do that. So I'll see you in about ten minutes. Okay. Thank you all.